And now for something completely different. Hello and welcome to episode 11 of The Real Football Cast. I'm your host Dan Tracy and in the next 60 minutes we're doing something different this week. Usually when it's the international break it's time to have a week off, but not anymore. For the simple reason that I found something better than talking all things football. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is moaning about it. More on that in a minute. Joining me tonight, I have Cole, who's returned from his honeymoon, and he starts married life. Cole, it's a pleasure to have you back on board. I hope all is well. And also being handed his debut tonight is Matthew Baldwin. Matthew's a Fulham fan, and we cross paths on the ill-fated Fan TV channel. Yes, an actual TV channel from a couple of seasons ago. I think it had something in the range of about eight viewers, but never mind. Matthew, it's been a while, and I'm looking forward to chatting to you this evening. I'd best do some social media bits first, otherwise we'll be talking into the abyss once more. First, if you want to get in touch with me, you can. That's on Twitter, at DanTracy1983. Anything show-related, send it my way. You can find me via iTunes. Search for Real Football Cast. And if you use that platform, don't forget to subscribe. That way, you'll never miss a single episode. And if you're not a fan of all things Apple, you can also find me on SoundCloud or Acast while the safest way to find all the links is by simply going to realfootballcast.com. As you should know by now, the Real Football Cast is sponsored by Loserpool. What is Loserpool, I hear you ask? It is a new game that sees betting turned on its head, with the focus being on the loser. If that has grabbed your interest, be sure to visit loserpool.com and create an account, especially as from this weekend there is a pool that will have a guaranteed prize pot of £1,000, something you will definitely not want to miss out on. Right then, it's time to go live. But before I do, I'd best explain the format for tonight's show. Cole and Matthew have been kind enough to offer up their football pet hates. One by one, they're going to volley towards me the things that they hate the most in our beautiful game. After a plea or a rant, I will decide if they get kicked in the bin. Kind of like a famous BBC show, but you know, you get the idea. Okay then, Matthew, as the debutant, you can go first. What is the first thing you'd like to see kicked in the bin? Um, well, I've decided to go for, um, you know, there's there's many things I'm sure many football fans can agree on in regards to what deserves to go into football hell. Seb Blatter, Platini, that lot. So I'm trying to be a bit creative with this. So the first one I've gone for, and it's a, re- it's a current trend, and it's children with handmade signs asking players for shirts. <laughs> what a start, now, I, yes. <laughs> now, I don't know where this trend came Obviously, one kid did it once. For some reason, why do I get the feel? I think it was Meza Ozil was the first one to sort of have this, you know, I don't want to call it an honour, this thing bestowed upon him. Some kid wrote a sign saying, I love Meza Ozil, can I have your shirt? He probably said something like, it's, it's my birthday, can I have your shirt? <laughs> With how and then for some reason it's become a thing and i put it on twitter a couple of weeks slash months ago there were two kids by the tunnel at old trafford one with again with how many shirts these guys looked about 10 or 11 so far too old to be doing this sort of thing anyway but one of them was asking for antonio valencia's shirt and the other was asking for ashley young now if you're man united fans what on God's greener are you doing asking for their shirts? If you're going to do this ridiculous thing, at least aim high. At least ask for Paul Pogba's shirt or Romelu Lukaku's shirt. You know, people who can actually play. Where you got this idea that you want to go to school on Monday and say, hey, I got a Man United you know, match-worn shirt. Oh, who'd you get? Ashley Young. Wh- wh- yeah. Why? Ow. Why? Why? It just doesn't make sense. Now, the whole thing is, if you're... You know this. If the the players come over after after a famous win, like when they stay up or they qualify the, for the cup final, or whatever, and players go and throw their things into it, should be luck of the draw. You shouldn't be asking for these things. This, these should be special moments. I have. I'm looking right at my Marcus Bettinelli one that we won. Um, we won in a, a, an FA Cup replay against Wolves in the snow, and I still have that proud because I was lucky enough to grab that from a pile of about 10 different hands or jumping in the air to grab it. It should be something you special, not something you should have. That's not something you ask for. Okay. So kids asking for football, you know, players shirts can, um, as the Scottish would say, can get a fuck. Uh, 
Very good. Are Carl. we allowed to swear, by the way, before I... Are we allowed to swear? Um, yeah, before I not. I think <laughs> okay. Pandora's box that, is open. If, <laughs> if that's my one, then that's my one. It's a good start. It's a solid start. Carl, uh, any counterpoint, or would you like to add to that? No, I think that's a valid point. Um, I think there are more things where we could say about kids in football. Um, and, you know, th- that asking for a shirt is almost as bad as someone trying to um, tweet a footballer at a footballer. You know, it's my son's birthday today. Can you send him a birthday message? Um, you know, and basically they go through the whole squad asking these players on Twitter to kind of reply saying happy birthday. Um, and you, you're sitting there, you know, I, I don't know if these people actually think that it is Harry Kane actually typing all these messages on his phone to some of these kids when you clearly know it's a PR team. Um, I think once I saw one bloke beg Harry Kane about five times to wish his kid happy birthday and you kind of was like, mate, it, he's, it's not happening, so give it up. So, yeah, I think there are a few things with kids in football. I've got one that involves um, kids, but that's more to do with players. Right, OK, we'll get to that one hopefully in a bit. But um, to be honest, Matthew, that was a lightning fast start straight out the blocks. And I think that one's definitely going to football hell. So congratulations. Kids signs for shirts and that kind of thing are definitely in the bin. So perfect start for Matthew. OK, then. Good Cole. start. Yeah, great start. Cole, what would you like to see first off kicked in the bin? The, the first thing I'd like to see then kicked in the bin, which I, I don't know where this started. Um, and it's something that having played football, I've never felt the need to do. Um, and you look at other sports and you don't really see it. And that is spitting. Now, I cannot stand watching a game of football because I don't know the amount of phlegm that most of these blokes must bring off the pitch with them nowadays when they play because it seems like everybody just has to no matter what they do they have a spit afterwards um and you see the camera pans on them and you know oh he's had a shot oh let me do a big gob because i just had a shot oh i'll run over there a minute let me have a gob um oh i've just done my laces need to have a gob we've even now got substitutes running on the pitch who haven't even played yet or done anything who have to have a gob and there must be so much spit and phlegm all over the pitch nowadays that it's, it's unbelievable most games are not called off through waterlog. Um, I don't know where it's coming. Um, you know, other sports, you see tennis players who probably run as much and sprinting as much as footballers, but you don't see them having a quick gob every two seconds after a point. You know, oh, there's a point. You know, there it goes. There's a nice another bit of spit, you know, and end up making a little river along the back line of the court, you know. So that is one thing I really can't abide, Dan. And, you know, and it's almost as bad as the one out the nose, you know, when you see a player close one of his nostrils and, and leave a nice big, you know, what a snot on the pitch. Um, and that, for me, mate, that has got to go. You know, I don't know where it's come from. I've never done it myself. I've played football. You guys have probably played football. I don't know whether you've ever felt the need to do that. You know, you know, constantly gobbing and spitting everywhere. Um, I can't stand it. It's one of the things I watch a game and I, every time I see a game, I'll probably nudge my missus and say, why does he need to do that? What's with this? And she just, you know, raises her eyes and says, you on this again? You know, let it go. And it's like, I can't let it go. It's, it's really doing me in. So I want to see spitting done then. OK, then. Uh, Math- Matthew, a yeah. point or anything to add there? No, I agree with you. I just want to bring up the point. Are we 100% sure um, that it's always spit? And the players in this age of, you know, world, you know, world famous nutrition, this isn't some sort of energy giving chewing gum. But they're, <laughs> they're getting through the game and then they thought, oh, after five minutes, all the energy's worn out. So, pff. That's why. And then they've got another bit in their sock that they're just, oh, <laughs> got to get that another, got to get the next one out. Like, you've never seen a goalkeeper spit because they don't need the energy. So that's, yeah. that's what you want. I'll tell you what, if this isn't a thing, I guarantee you within the next month of this podcast coming out, Wrigley's or well, yes, I say, yeah, Orbit Wrigley's. Really, or anyone will have come up with energy giving chewing gum. Hubba like, Bubba. We'll, we'll have Hubba Bubba. Exactly. Go. Um, well, this, yeah, this spit brought to you by Wrigley. It could happen, <laughs> but first it's got to get out of the bin because that's going in the bin. I can I can slightly appreciate sometimes if you do need to spit if you're clearing your lungs while playing some kind of sport, but it's the needless level of gobbing that Carl was so adequately sort of put his point across. It is every couple of minutes. It's too much. We don't need to see it in the game. So that one is in the bin. So you're both on one at the moment. It's a, a good start. Um, Matthew, your second offering, please. 
Okay, now this is the one where I feel I'm going to touch the you know the football romantics heart over this thing. Okay, and it's physical copies of the cherished items, and I'm talking specifically about programs and tickets. Now, I am in no way a voice for the Green Party. I cannot stand them. I think they're a bunch of you know lefty liberal hippie lunatics. But I will st- I will agree with them on this point. We are living in a world where we want to, you know, declutter the whole thing, where we want to recycle plastic and, you know, or get rid of the one use plastic, you know, recycle. We don't want things clogging up the oceans, all that sort of thing. And not only in the oceans, but in our houses, I have, and again, this is another thing of point of reference. Um, this is probably going to be the last one for this episode, but I'm looking at my box of programs that I've collected over the years. They're serving no use to me at this point. I'm sure when I was younger, when I was younger, I used to collect autographs. I'd go behind, you know, um, again, I didn't ask anyone for an autograph. I just stood there hoping someone would sign. I didn't specifically shout, going back to my previous point. But now they're just sitting there. Why can't we just get rid of the programs and tickets as well? Because I'm flooded with no tickets. We're living in in an age where everything is digital. Why can't we just get the programs on your phone? Why do we need to produce you know, 10,000 match day programs when the only reason we ever bought programs was to keep ourselves entertained when there was a break in play, when it was half time, when there was an injury or something. But now everyone's got mobile phones. They're checking Twitter. They're checking their, their fantasy football update. Oh, has my triple captain got an assist today or whatever? I don't play fantasy football anymore. But that's a different point. Would clue to our phone, so why not make the use of that? Why not put the match day program on your phone where you can click through it, you can save them, you can have 10,000 programs from every single game across the world onto a little memory stick. You, we don't need all this needless clutter that's clogging up the world. The same goes for tickets. When I, I went on a uh, on a, uh, an East Coast tour of America recently, and I want I watched uh, I want to say seven baseball games. I don't have any tickets from that because it will just clutter up my room or or go in the bin afterwards. I have every single receipt or ticket stub, if you want to put it that way, on my phone, so I could reminisce on my phone. Say when I'm flicking through old photos. Oh yeah, I remember that game. That was a good game. We can do all the needless romanticizing. If, if you want to call it necessary romanticizing, fine. You can do all that, but it's just to have it on your phone. You don't need all these things cluttering up your house. It's an interesting viewpoint. Carl, anything to add to that? Uh, no, I, I, I like that point. And I, I'd also add to that now, especially when you consider that if you looked at a modern day program now, you could probably take 10 pages out of that through beer advertisements and watch advertisements. Um, they're filled with so much junk nowadays that actually most people are not concerned with. So, yeah, I kind of I kind of go along with that now that, you know, I remember my dad when he first started going said the program is just basically a piece, one piece of paper. Um and he's got he's got programs going back from the 60s in his loft doing nothing. Um, and potentially I'll just flog him and sell him once he's once he's copped it. Bless him, the poor old boy. Um, so I can kind of agree with this. I can see where we're going with this one. Um, I kind of quite like the idea. And I think, you know, most people getting in the modern day, if you signed up to the Spurs app or something like that or your club's app, then that's how you'd probably get your match day program through there. And if you wanted to view it, you just click on the right option. So I like this idea. Yeah, exactly. And if you uh, bring the cost down, because I don't I don't know what the cost, but if it costs, say, one pound to uh, produce a program, when you take in the ink, the stapling, the folding, and all that sort of stuff, if it takes one pound to produce a program, and they're selling it for three pound or three pound fifty, if you just take, take away that process, and it'll take, what, cost a penny or something, in minimum wage for some person to actually just put all the stuff online, you can then sell it for a pound, and more people are going to buy it because they're going to. It's going to be a more reasonable, more reasonable price. People are going to say three fifty for you know for what now? It's it's just it's another it's another way and a better way for for the clubs to make their money. Mm, right. Okay. You make very good cases, and I like the way you're sort of designing the future of the program. But I am a romantic, and I like the old school program and the memories that that comes and the sort of tickets and the sort of scrapbook format. And without those elements, I'd have an empty scrapbook. So unfortunately, football pro- physical copies of programmes and tickets are not going in the bin this week. So 
your first blank there, Matthew. Apologies, but I, it's my decision at the end of the day. So. You, you are what's wrong with this world. I am. You, yeah, it's me. <laughs> I'm what's wrong with you. Football. Embrace the change. <laughs> No, I mean... You lefty, Dan. You <laughs> liberal lefty. Whoa, whoa, whoa. This is an apolitical <laughs> football podcast. Don't jump me down that level. But, um, I mean, you do make some very salient points about, you know, future-proofing with the app and the quality of programmes. They are sort of naff, but I don't think it's really the, the quality of the programme that you're almost buying. You're buying that memory to take back after the game. But that's a sort of other topic we could sort of go down further. But a good, good suggestion, don't get me wrong, but um, it's staying out of the bin for now. So, Carl... Uh, your second serve, what have you got for me? Okay, so we'll, we'll go back to kind of like the kids, if you like, oh, being involved in, in the football. It's not a kid-friendly podcast, is it? It's not. It's not. I have now fed up of seeing a player's whole family tree of children coming on the pitch when they win a trophy or, um, you know, at the end of season, all of a sudden the last home game, you know, the player brings on his kids, his sister's kids, his brother's kids, his, you know, mates at school's kids. They all come on the pitch and do a lap of honour with these players. And quite frankly, I'm fed up of it. I, I don't want to see your kids. You know, I've come to watch you play football. If you've won a trophy, I just want to see the, the players who finished that game or that squad going around parading the cup, you know, I, I'm not worried about, you know, Aguero or Ericsson or Kane having his kids on there in a replica kit, you know, with his name on the back, daddy, and they've got the headphones on because of the noise. Well, if you're worried about your kids' ears and the noise, don't bring them on the pitch to start <laughs> with. Um, so that, for me, that's become a real bugbear of mine watching it because, as I say, it's now become, like I say, now they bring the family on. And when you consider some of these, you know, we're bringing players over from Latin America, you know, being married to a Colombian, if I was to play football and win a trophy and bring her family on the pitch, well, I'll tell you now, <laughs> there'd be more than there is in the ground, Dan. I can tell you. You know, I'd, I'd be having demands left, right and centre. So I think we need to get rid of this. No, we don't want no kids. We don't want no one's wife on the pitch. You know, I just want to see you win a game or the last game of the season, Walk around, chaps. You've done your bit. We're there to say thank you if you've done well or, you know, appreciate what you've done for the season. But I'm not interested in seeing your kid. Leave him in the stands or at home. Ah, sorry, that's, that, that, that's no, kids, no. unkid friendly, but I'm sorry. That's I've had fine. Enough. That's fine. It's your, your suggestion, mate. Uh, Matthew, anything to add on yeah. that one? Same thing. I I agree with you to a point. I I agree with you know bringing the whole family because usually they they usually you know they're now accompanied by their wives their their wives and girlfriends. Um, I think it's okay just for the kids so long as it's just your you know one or two children you know in daddy's arms if they're like one or two just to give them just to give. I agree. I I and I think there's a limit. For an empty season, you know, lap of appreciation. Yes, maybe then leave leave them in the you know in the players' lounge or whatever. But I think when they're uh, parading a trophy round, I think that's sort of the one occasion where I can sort of forgive it, where they're you know the the official club photographer will just have them lined up. Um, Sergio Aguero, when he's won the trophy, you know, you know his kids are like one and two, you know, barely, you know, not even taller than the Premier League trophy, but he'll have him sat down, him smiling with the Man City fans behind him. And that's something that he can like, you know, cherish forever. I'll agree. I'll agree to that. But I do absolutely agree with you that there is a sort of limit to the amount of people you should be bringing. You should be bringing on. Otherwise, as you said, there's going to be more people on the pitch than there is in the stands. I absolutely agree with you there. But as much as I don't like kids asking for shit, there is a let. Kids do have some place in football, <laughs> but not but not a complete place. <laughs> okay, then. So for me, kids don't really have a place in this podcast. They shouldn't really be listening to it anyway. So unfortunately, kids, you're going in the bin again twice in yes. what, twenty minutes. It's not a good start for the kids. <laughs> yeah, I just think it's, it's just too much, isn't it? You know, like where do you draw the line? Like three, four kids running around the pitch, and it's just like, oh, don't yeah. get me wrong. You know, I'm not I'm some killjoy, but. I don't need it. Like, imagine... well, then we get the one who dribbles the ball to the goal, don't yeah, we? And yeah, it falls yeah. over just before he puts the yeah. ball in the net. Oh, exactly. Get off. Exactly. <laughs> we don't need it. I mean, just did it happen at the World Cup final? I don't think it did. I mean, obviously, would you then send your sort of kids internationally? I don't know. Like Carl reference. So, Carl, I think for the sake of your sort of 
multiple airfares and all that kind of bills you'd have to sort of uh, be inclined to pay <laughs> should you win a trophy. I don't know when that will be, but if it does happen, thankfully, kids will be in the bin at that point, so you don't have to worry yes. about flying them in. So it's two for two from Cole. Matthew's got a bit of catch up to do, but hopefully he can turn things around with his third suggestion. So Matthew, what have you got for me this time? Um, well, this is uh, quite apt given the time that we're recording this, and it's international breaks. Oh. Now, I agree that you know I'm not one of these people that say you should have all your international games during the summer. You know, you know, all international games, be they qualifying for tournaments or the tournaments themselves, have them in June, have them in June and July. You know, end the season a week earlier, start the season two weeks later, sort of thing. I, I, I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan of that. What I would say is take a leaf from other sports and keep playing your club games whilst the international games are still going on. So here's my so here's my theory. It's an international break. Manchester United are playing Chelsea. We don't see Eden Hazard and David De Gea and David Luiz and Rom- and Romelu Lukaku uh, strolling out strolling out of the Old Trafford Tunnel. We see the Manchester United and, and Chelsea under twenty threes. Now, what have we been saying for years? Um, I say this re- we as a, a royal we um, because I'm Welsh, but. All the um, English people have said, you know, we need to get English players, the young English players, get more game time in big games. So what better way to give them experience of playing in big games than to let them play in the Premier League? Let the whole team play in the Premier League where there's no pressure to get three points that could eventually not, you know, win the under-23 league, which no one gives a toss about, um, which isn't even right because it includes teams from the Championship Academy for some weird reason. Um let them play and let them play for actual points that people care about. Given that experience of given the experience of being matched, if you want, include this to the Champions League as well. Have international breaks at the same time the Champions League is going on. Have eighteen year old a whole team of under eighteens playing in the Champions League if you so desire. But that's my idea. Is give is we and then there's also the joy of you get an international football and club double header. You walk out of your Manchester United Chelsea game straight to the pub, watch England play or watch Wales play or you know Old Firm Derby on you know Old Firm Derby twelve o'clock on the Saturday, three o'clock so, uh, Scotland kick off at Hampden Park. Wouldn't that just be a grand thing for everyone to enjoy? It's an interesting concept, very interesting actually. I've never thought that one before. Uh, got me on the hop there, but uh, but Cole, have you got anything to add on that one? Well, I, I kind of agree slightly with this because I, I'm not a lover of these um, the international breaks, especially when they're for nothing meaningless friendlies. Um, I don't think there's anything worse than you know your club season being stopped for a friendly that no one really cares about, and you then send the players away, and you know half of them have probably been told, well, you know, well you might have a mystery, you know slight pull here or a pull there and I think it's understandable because you know if you're a club playing these players big money and you've got big games coming up and then you know everything stops for two weeks while you play Senegal and you know uh, I don't know Madagascar just to walk and you know have a friendly it's like why are we bothering with this you know I don't like friendlies I only want to see international breaks for competitive football and then after that that's it I don't want to see internationals anymore because they, they end up with, you know, 25 subs going on. You know, no one cares. Um, there's no passion. The crowds don't really care. So I kind of can agree with this. I'm not sure I'd want to see us play without our main stars. And I'm not sure people would want to spend money on tickets knowing that they then may lose, you know, four or so games throughout the season where they won't see their key players. Um, and especially given the amount that Spurs have got in the England squad at the moment, we certainly wouldn't. I certainly wouldn't fancy us missing half our squad right now at each international break. But... Yeah, Do you I'm have definitely... no faith in the Spurs Academy that the players can't <laughs> step up? Is this not what Spurs are built on, on great academy players like Harry Winks and Harry I'll, Kane? I'll, I'll hold my answer. <laughs> I, don't, I don't see many more coming through other than them right now. Um, so, no, I, I kind of agree. I, I'll go half and half with this one. I want to see the international break scrapped. I'm not sure I like the idea of seeing the under-23s. Right, OK, then, so... Let me um, summarise this one. I think from an under-23 point of view, it's a good idea when you explain the rationale of giving them game time. But what doesn't sit well with me is the fact that 
the Premier League's integrity would almost be ruined. You can almost argue it's been ruined already, but it's be ruined because then there'd be an imbalance in the quality of fixtures. Why would a team like Chelsea, Tottenham, Man United, for example, be punished with having more internationals, whereas a team such as Burnley, Huddersfield would, could then play a weakened team and it helps them out. So that wouldn't really work. I think there'd be a bit. By the way, more... by the way, you say Premier League. This is this is Europe and worldwide. Yeah. League would have the same thing. League One, Serie A, the whole thing. Yeah, but a whole lot. A, it, Regardless of the league, it would ruin the sort of inter-league competition, wouldn't it? So I think that would be an issue. And I think, controversially, as much as I hate international breaks, they have to stay because without them, you don't get the World Cup and the European Championships. So you need that period of darkness to get to the, the light at the end of the tunnel, don't you? So, you know, without the uh, the rubbish fixtures, we don't get the good ones every four, two years, whatever you look, want to look at it. So unfortunately... International breaks, controversially, are not being kicked in the bin this week. I think I've started too hard. I'm starting to falter. I need a, need a second wind yeah. for the last two subjects. <laughs> yeah, don't worry, don't worry. I mean, there's still time to turn things around, but, you know, it's just that's just the opponent you've come up against. But um, a good suggestion, though. Don't be wrong. They're all very solid suggestions. It's just, um, I guess, the mood I'm in tonight. But uh, unfortunately, no, international breaks, not going in the bin. So, Cole, can you keep up your 100% record? What have you got third time around? So for me, Dan, I think this is something that, again, I'd like to think is going to be a bugbear for most people. Um, and this is going to be um, inconsistency with refs, linesmen. And this is this little thing now where you see throw-ins being taken 15 yards further forward than they are um, when the ball's gone out. Um, you know, you see a free kick get given right in the corner by the corner flag. Um, and then the next thing you know, the goalkeeper's got it virtually near the halfway line um, in the centre of the pitch. And you get a referee just waving him on and you're going, hold on a minute. That free kick was right in the corner flag, virtually on the corner flag. And somehow he's 10 yards further forward and 10 yards in the in towards the centre of the pitch just to get him a nicer position and place the kick. Same with the throw-ins, you know, a throw-in goes out near the corner flag and before he's taken it, he's almost in the su- in with the subs and the manager's having a chat, you know, because he's been allowed to walk forward 15 yards by a referee and linesman who are just looking at him. And then we're starting to wonder why, you know, refs will start to wonder why and the game's going to wonder why players don't have respect for officials. Um, and it's just the little thing where these players are allowed to get away with, you know, to basically piss-taking. And it'll be the same with corners. I have a real bugbear about corners when we've got a quadrant and you see the player trying to balance that ball on the thinnest bit of white line rather than placing the ball inside the quadrant, which is how it used to be. And that that is the whole point of that quadrant in the corner. So I guess I'm going to say this is maybe more aimed at referees and officials allowing players to take liberties during a game and basically flaunt and say to him i don't really care where you know i should be taking this i'll take it where i want to take it and that to me dan is really winds me up when i see it during the game okay it's a good shout matthew what have you got to add to that one now see i again this i don't want this to be a whole thing you know all referees are rubbish we know that to start with um but i can sort of understand that the pernicketiness of it, like what you mentioned, like what you mentioned with the quad, what you mentioned with the uh, with the quarter quadrant, because isn't the rule that the ball has to be overhanging the quadrant? You know, it doesn't have to be inside, That's as right, long as yeah. a part well, of the ball the thing, is it? over the whatever. I think yeah. there just there just needs to be a little bit more um, uh, strictness about what the rules are in the first place. Yeah, like like and for throw-ins in the corner. I'll allow a yard. I, I, I agree with you there. I'll allow one yard of, of give and take. You know, if someone you know just stumbles and uh, throws it over, I I get that. But also, I think there's a case of so long as they're being terrible for both teams, surely it's one of those it's one of those things that you know that evens out. One team gets the ball, you know, takes for a me, throw in fifteen yards further forward. The other team takes one fifteen yards further forward. It's not as if it's it's like a home field advantage thing. Oh no, there's definitely no the bias rules. being done. For me, I just hate the fact that you're sitting there going, "Why are you allowing this guy to walk forward?" Even when Spurs players do it, I don't care who's doing it. For me, whenever I see it, I'm sitting there going, "Why are you referee and linesman watching that bloke just keep walking further up the pitch?" And, and taking the throw-in from there 
when it was right there. Or we saw where the free kick was because it was the bloke knocked the corner flag when he went out of play. And somehow he's now in the middle of the goal taking a free kick. How have you allowed him to take it from that position? And I, it's just for me, I don't care. who's. I think it's one of them, I suppose I'm just fussy that I would have to say as a referee, well, where are you going? The corner, it was you was in the corner where you got fouled. Take the ball to the corner flag, please, player. I think, don't try and make a mug of me. You know, I, it was out there. So, I yeah, I, I'm of, just picky. I think it's one of those things. If it's in the corner, you know, if it's a corner, it's not really going to make that much of a difference because the team's got to go all the way up the other end. They've still got time to defend. It's, you know, if there was a, you know, a foul. Um, in the corner, you know, again on the corner, and the team was attacking, and the player decided to go 15 yards further back so that he got a different angle, so Rory Delap style he could launch it in at a better angle. I sort of agree with you, but I think it's a, if it's a defensive thing, um, then I think there should be a little bit more fluidity. Just, just because I don't, it's not really that important. Because what's going to happen? You know, the ball's going to bounce, you know on the halfway line rather than 10 yards behind the halfway line. It's not going to make that much of a difference. So I can see that's where the, you know, uh, uh, leniency, if we can call it that way, that's where the leniency uh, comes into it. Whereas when it's further forward, you'll see referees march up and point to the, to the exact blade of grass that know the foul happened outside the area, right there. So but then when he it, turns his back, the player will spin the ball 10 yards further forward. I, Again, I, think, I think my point here is players, um, what I would say, just abusing, uh, if you like, the, the players just taking the piss, basically. Right, okay. And, and they, they know they're moving it further forward than it should be. And you have a referee who just kind of goes, oh, yeah, go on and take it. Okay, no, well, no, no. I've taken no. all the feedback on board. <laughs> and I don't think I'm going to let this one in the bin, only because oh. you'd have nothing to shout at during the game. True. You, you know, you you know, FNL ref, like, what are you doing? And Matthew's right, and then if they were all blatantly for one team, you'd be like, hang on, what is going on? But if it's a bad ref and both teams are sort of putting the wall over his eyes, then it does balance each other out. And I think, like I say, it winds back to you want to vent at the ref anyways, and I think that is a, an integral part of going to the game, isn't it? So I think we need that in football. As frustrating as it is, because you're all right, it's the nicking of yards and a badly positioned corner where it shouldn't, but, you know... It should be policed better, but I think we need that element in the game to make it what it is, especially from a, a match day going atmosphere. So, unfortunately, Carl, your 100% record is over. That one's oh. not being kicked into the bin. So, Matthew, can you get back to winning ways with number four? Now, I'm glad this, is ha- this has coincided perfectly with half-time of the Wales Republic of Ireland game, so I can give this my full throttle's worth of attention. OK, mate. And it's perfect because it concerns the Irish. Ooh. Not necessarily, Ooh. not necessarily, not necessarily the Irish, right. but the treatment and the loving that seems to exist between the media, uh, social media, and the you know the press and Irish fans. Where did this loving that every single thing that the Irish fans do is the greatest thing that ever happened? If you look at what the Irish fans get praised for. They get praised for all wearing the same colour. You know, they're the boys in green or they're the green army. Just like the Brazilians do by wearing yellow, just like the French do wearing blue, the Dutch wearing orange, the Danish wearing red, the Welsh wearing red, the Belgians wearing red, the Swedish wearing yellow, the Australians all wear yellow. You get my point. Yep. What That's nothing special. That's you know, wearing your team's colours. That's what you're meant to do, isn't it? You know, you're meant to wear the shirt of the, the, the team you support. Um they drink a lot they drink a lot of of alcohol is you know they're always up for a party have any of you ever had the privilege and i say this is a privilege of having a scottish team mainly southcan rangers come down to your ground for a pre-season friendly they will drink your town dry rangers even did that to the city of manchester in 2008 did, yes. there was not a there was not a single drop of alcohol left to buy in the city of Manchester for that UEFA Cup final. Don't you dare say that the Irish are the only people who enjoy a drink and enjoy a laugh. And the third thing, they're always up for a laugh. They're always up for as if the, no, the world doesn't. You know, again, I say this. For, I say this for Scott just because, uh, just because because they're the one. Um, they're, they're always up for a laugh. You know, Frankie Boyle. Have you never heard of him or Billy Connolly 
or Kevin Bridges or any other comedians around the world. Don't it's just I don't get why people think that what the Irish do. You no, know, they all sing along for 90 minutes. What you're meant to do. They all behave very well like you're meant to do. Like, what are the Irish fans doing that is so special and unique that we need to treat them as if they're God's chosen people? There, there are fans worldwide who do the exact same thing as the Irish, yet no one gets any mention of them. But for some reason, the Irish... I have a theory as to why this happened. It's basically because the English fans went through a period from... You know, you talk about uh, there was fighting at the World Cup in 86 uh, when they played Argentina. Basically, the whole of the 80s, um, there was um, incidents in Euro 2000 when they were smashing up things. You have uh, Euro 2016 where you had the fight with the Russians. It's basically the English media have their perceptions of what fans should be dragged so low by the, de- by the behavior of English fans that all of a sudden fans acting normally just resets the moral high bar and think that's how you should be behaving. That's the greatest thing ever. No, applaud them, the class acts, when they're only doing what they're meant to be doing. But for some reason, they're treated as they're treated as gods on, on social media. Right, okay. rant over. Cole, I don't even need your input for this one because, Matthew, I absolutely agree. I'll tell you why. First-hand um, evidence of this, me and my friends went en masse to uh, Euro 2016. We went to watch... Um, Switzerland, Poland, bit of a random game, but that's what the tickets we got. We were in Lyon, and Ireland played France the next day. And my God, they were just like, they're everywhere, they're like locusts, and they do not stop drinking. And when you've sort of been drunk all day and you're quite tired, they just keep going and going. They're just like relentless, and they're just, you know, en masse and noisy. You know, don't get me wrong, I love football as much as the next person, but... Jesus, they just don't stop. So for that reason, by the way, this is but no, no, this isn't me criticizing the Irish fans. What they do is fine. It's what they. It's just the way that they're perceived as the greatest thing to ever grace the earth. They're not. That's my issue. The greatest thing because I've seen them up close and they're not the greatest thing. So it's absolutely fine, Matthew. It's they as a a unit are going into the bin. So two for four now, Matthew. Congratulations. Back to five hundred. I hope you two seal up your letterboxes um, tonight. Uh, <laughs> this, is, this might only go out in the UK then. So. <laughs> but, uh, oh, no, anyway. Hang on, this goes, this goes for the Northern Irish fans as well. I, I, I don't like their treatment either. So, yeah. Right, OK. Right, right, just make it even more tougher for me. OK, well, let's move on very quickly, shall we? Um, Cole, pick number four, please. Substitutions Ooh, um, for me, Dan. And this is more around what I consider these time-wasting substitutions that actually now really just grind you during a game. And that is when you see, you know, with 30 seconds to go, a team bringing on a bloke and his whole purpose is just to run on the pitch and then just as soon as he's on and gets to his position, the referee blows a whistle. Um, I think the whole substitution um, process needs to be looked at. I don't understand why we can't have something in this modern day where the ball goes up and a player just runs off at the nearest point of the pitch where you know, he's at. So if he's over the far side of the pitch, because that, that's the other thing we see, isn't it? When there's, when there's a minute left of the game... Harry Kane, if he knows he's being brought off, he trots to the furthest point of the pitch he can get to. And then as soon as his number goes up, he takes the slow trudge, doesn't he? You know, pretends to have a little jog, but then walks again. And there's half these subs most of the time are just not necessary. Or it's like, OK, you're coming off, but you're over the far side of the pitch. Well, just walk off over there, player. You're right by the touchline. Walk off. You can walk round the the pitch to get back to the line and we'll let your man come on and the game can get underway again or why can't we just keep the game going now you know the bottom line is if he's coming off get off the pitch as quick as you can and your new bloke coming on can't come on the pitch until he's off officially um I, it just really winds me up, you know, especially, like I say, the ones where the guy runs all the way across the far side of the pitch and he takes a slow jog and the referee has to trot over to him and try to herd him along like a sheep, you know, to get him off the pitch. When we all know what it's done for, I'd even go as far to say there should be no substitutions in the last five minutes of games. Even if you go down to 10 men, 
most teams for five last five minutes of a game could deal with playing with ten men. Um, you know, or if that guy is just slightly injured, well, he just goes on the wing like in the old days, and you just see it out from there. Um, I don't know what your views are on that. I just really hate these time-wasting substitutions. I think we're just losing time, and that whole process can be done a lot better and a lot quicker. Interesting. Okay, Matthew, anything to add to Cole's fourth pick? No, I, 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 I can't see any. I can't see any real flaws flaws with the argument. I, I do agree. There are substitutions where you know there's three minutes worth of added on time, and it gets to you know ninety two minutes forty five, and there's a player stripped off, ready to be. I do agree with you. I, I, I don't agree with the whole, you know, there shouldn't be any substitutions after the 85th minute. Maybe after the 90th, I get, because, you know, you could have, you know, you know the, the team that's, you know, a goal down throws one more. There's another thing about substitutions, just point, in terms of pointless substitutions, teams waiting until, like, the 85th minute to bring on their final attacker when they should have done so five minutes early. I get you, the, the whole way the substitutions have gone is completely straight. And I will agree with you that, yeah, there are some substitutions as you say that are completely pointless so yeah i agree with you kick it in i don't i don't i don't mind i think i'm losing this anyway so i agree with you kick it in i mean to be honest from a devil's advocate point of view which is the role i'm trying to play tonight you talk about sort of late subs and time wasting is frustrating but as a supporter of a team say you were one nil up is that not considered good game management so and then you win and you think well, oh, what's you know, the point of it yeah well Wouldn't well it? what is the point is you eating into the clock, held on to your, your win, got three points, or into the next round of the cup, aren't you? So that is the point. And if a manager does that more often than not, he's lost. If, if the referee manager. was, if the referee was doing his job though, he'd add on the time. He'd add the time. That's, that's, yes, that's the, yes. the Now, pitch. to be fair, that is the bugbear here, where it's say two minutes on the clock or three minutes on the clock, like you say, and then the substitution takes a minute, but you don't get the extra minute added on to that, so it eats into the the last three minutes. Now, that is a bugbear, which I think, had you gone more direct with that one, that probably could have been kicked into the bin. But I think, sub- oh, it's a tough one. Um, <laughs> I'm going to say no. Think I've... about what happens if you're losing, though, yeah. Dan. You're thinking if you're winning this game here. Now, what if you're losing 1-0 and it's, you know, say Chelsea, one of our hated rivals, are bringing Hazard off and he's trotting from the furthest corner. How are you feeling at that moment? I'll be annoyed. I'm trying, I'm trying it, Dan. I'm trying. But I want to celebrate the wins more because I think you need the wins more in football <laughs> than the defeats, don't you? So, unfortunately, that one is staying out, which means we're down to our, our last picks each, gentlemen. So, I don't know if you've been holding a blockbuster or this is your fifth penalty taker who's perhaps a little bit weaker, but this is it, Matthew, your last one. What have you got for me? Um, this sort of came about, there was a social media post went around a couple of, a couple of weeks ago and it was a fan who, I think it was away at Middlesbrough, played six, uh, paid six pound 50 for cheesy chips. And it was just a thing of chips with yeah, two slices. Oh, I saw <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm sure everyone's seen the picture. So my point is in this modern age, why is there still so much shite food at games? Why are we still eating the same thing? Um, I'm not an exper- I'm not an experimentalist with food. You know, I'm I'm uh, a fussy eater. I you know I've never I've never eaten an Indian or a Chinese or a Thai or a curry in my life. Never have. I don't wish to. But for the other people in this modern age, when there, there's so much choice available, when there's you know Uber Eats and Deliveroo and Just Eat, I'm not saying get fans to order food in you no know, order takeaways. I'm not saying that. <laughs> order it, you know, order it. Imagine the exactly. <laughs> Over the tannoy, can Mr. Smith please report to his nearest steward your pepperoni pizza is ready for collection? Whatever. I'm not saying that. But why can't we get better quality food inside stadiums? And I'm not talking about in the hospitality. I'm talking in the concourse areas. Like you you guys are both Spurs fans. You've got you've got a brand new stadium coming. I, I think you do anyway. I've I've not been told about it. Um I've been to the Mercedes-Benz Stadium in Atlanta. They have a Chick-fil-A. If anyone's ever been to America and seen the gorgeousness of those Chick-fil-A, they have fast food restaurants in the stadium. They have local ciders and local beers and local produce and all this great stuff. Why can't, Why is it so hard for us to not get, you know, um, a Sunday roast or, or any decent food? In, there's so many, you know, local eateries that you can, that you can build off and sort of have local... Local pride, get a local butcher's to set up a stall and a little bar 
barbecue and sell locally produced locally produced hot dogs rather than this three pound fifty for rollover in a cold baguette stuff. There's so much that you can do in regards to food in this world. Why are we still eating the same stuff that we were having? No, 10 or 15 years ago. It's time for us to just open up, get local companies in, get local, even if you have to have fast food restaurants or pizzerias. I don't care. Just get more decent food outlets into stadiums so we can have a decent, even if it's slightly overpriced, I don't care. Just give me some decent food at a game. Okay. Um, it's a decent point. I like where it's going. Cole, can you tip this one over the edge? Well, Dan, I think we've both, you know, having... having spent you know nearly a season and a bit now at Wembley I think you probably would agree with me you know when when you consider what we're paying for this food and the quality of it yeah um just to get a dirty you know bit of plastic hamburger in a grotty bit of bread that's now cost me seven pound eight pound fifty um and you take it back and go well that must be one of the worst you know eight nearly ten pound I've spent on a burger in my life I can kind of fully agree with this one because, you know, yeah, the food at football grounds, given the price we're being charged, is utterly dreadful. Um, my only issue with the guy who got the cheesy chips was that he actually took it and paid for it. Um, because, you know, this was just chips with two slices of cheese put on top of it. Um, but I fully agree with this, you know, and say, having spent some time at Wembley um, and seen what we're dished up there, then, yeah, I'd be behind this one. It's a clean sweep, lads. I'm on board for this one as well because, yeah, football food as a general rule is just outrageously bad. Like Carl's just said, Wembley food, I mean, I just don't even bother anymore. I just go hungry because the value of the food for the quality is just a joke. So, Again, I'm... you wouldn't mind paying that £8.50 or whatever it is for or whatever it is for a burger if it was from Gourmet Burger Kitchen or something. You know, if Jamie Oliver produced a special... Maybe not Jamie Oliver because he's a bit of a dick, but if, so, if some... Uh, chef produced a range of food just to have in just to have in stadiums you'd be you'd be okay with being priced uh being overcharged as long as it was actually decent i don't think it's necessarily the price point because you've got to remember you are sort of a captive audience you're there aren't you you can't go elsewhere in that two hours so if you had to pay extra then begrudgingly you would as long as the quality was a lot better so it's not necessarily banish all food it's just raise the threshold quality of food isn't it so that's certainly yeah. in the bin that's a great shout so that um wraps up three out of five for matthew so cole what have you got for your last in the bin offering please so for me then it's watching football on the telly and the one thing that i'm fr- I, I can't be the only one who gets frustrated is when suddenly at a certain point during a game we get this camera pan on a manager or a substitution for about what feels like about five minutes while the game's going on in the background. And you're now sitting here going, why am I looking at this bloke as a substitute while the game is going? How many times does Sky suddenly during a game flash up an image of Jurgen Klopp standing on the touchline or Jose Mourinho or, you know, any manager? or a substitution, or someone in the crowd, you know, the player who's not playing today. All of a sudden, we're on the attack. Oh, let's go and have a look at Klopp standing on the touchline for a minute, and that's tell you a really non-interesting fact. And when we turn the camera back, suddenly it's a goal kick, and you've missed what happened. You've no idea now how it got to be a goal kick, or how your player suddenly got in the position he is, because the camera has been panned on someone who you've no interesting whatsoever for about what i say it feels like about five minutes it's probably a minute why can't these people stick a small box in the corner where they then show you the picture but you can still see the main game going on i don't know how many times this year i've nearly missed goals or sky have nearly missed goals because they've panned away to do some nothing shot and you look back and the ball's nearly trickling over the line for a goal and you then go well i don't know what happened what happened there because we've all missed it yeah I tell you, um, great example so for of that. me it's that stupid 
I mean, I think we had the example, didn't we, where um, Czech yes, nearly put it in his own exactly goal in the first say. game of the that season. That is the one. That is the one. You know, spot on. They've panned to Pep Guardiola standing on the sidelines, scratching his nails or picking his nose because there's nothing, you know, what we think is going to be interesting. And we miss what could have been the greatest moment in Premier League history, which would have been Czech scoring an own goal from a goal kick. Um and yeah, it, for me, I just don't get why these TV companies feel the need to do it or what they think we actually care that we want to see this bloke sitting on the subs bench and we want to see his stats. Or suddenly that you'll be attacking and Sky want to flash up their next game. Oh, Super Sunday, Brighton versus Huddersfield. Oh, do me a favour. We've missed what's happened now to see your bloody advertising. Um, that for me, Dan, that's got to go in the bin. I, I, it really does my head in while I'm watching a game. I, 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 abs- I absolutely agree with you. And what's worse is that they had this sorted. Does anyone remember player cam? Yeah, yeah. 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 In the other, used to press the red button, yeah. and for like 15 minutes, it would just focus on one player. Yeah. They yeah. had this and then went away with it. And I think BT in their early days, in their very early days when they when they first got into Premier League. It may have been the first game of the season where I first saw this. Uh, Liverpool were playing Sunderland, I believe it was. And they had... Um, uh, Sunderland had a penalty in the last minute. It may have been Stoke. It was one of the strike teams. It was anyway. Stoke, isn't it? Whoever, I don't care. Um, they, were, they had... Uh, someone, someone had a penalty in the last minute. And they had the full screen, I think the end-on camera as well, which is another thing we didn't get around to tonight, of the penalty. And then they had the little box in the corner of I think the two managers of it was been, it would have been Brendan Rogers and at that point uh, uh, managing Stoke Mark Hughes I want to yeah, say yeah, yeah yeah they had that and I think in an earlier game um, they when Liver or a later game rather when Norwich were playing Liverpool they had the thing and they cut to yeah, a clip a uh, thing of Jurgen Klopp on the sideline but it was in a little box on the side that's the thing they had this idea they perfected it and yet for some reason they went away with it when most fans will tell you hang on we want that. Let's get that back. I would honestly, in today's in today's game, wouldn't you want to see you know player cam? Wouldn't you want to see Jose Mourinho and Pep Guardiola on the on the touchline together when things are kicking off? It it they had it, but they lost it. Sorry, carry on. No, you're fine, and you're absolutely right as well. We we seem to have regressed, haven't we? It's not just the fact that it's something that we've never seen before. It's, it's A, it's taking away something that was good and B, it's just getting worse now. So it's all about this constant drama that we need to see. But like you say, Carl, it's useless tidbits about what Pep's had for lunch this, this afternoon. Yeah, right, you know what I mean? yeah. It's just not necessary. And the Petr Cech example was absolutely the perfect example because we nearly missed the goal. Do you know what I mean? And have they just shown a replay of what had happened, it would have lost its magic. And like you say, it was almost a goal moment which is not even captured. So... You're absolutely right. I can't argue with that at all. What should we call it? Bad direction, I guess. From football yeah, it's got to be, isn't it? Bad yeah. Direction, yeah. That's going into the bin. So, chaps, you've um, you've done quite well actually. Above average, uh, three out of five per person. So, you know, team effort, six out of ten. I like the way you sort of teamed up with me um, on on some occasion to sort of get the better of me. It worked sometimes. Sometimes it didn't. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, it's great suggestions. But you're not off the hook just yet because I need uh, one more bit of information from you, and that's our loser pool picks of the week. So, um, Matthew, this weekend we've got um, the international break is long gone, thankfully. So I just want to know who you think is a guaranteed loser this week and why. Um, I'm going for Brighton and Hove Albion away to Newcastle United. I think this whole stuff with um, Mike Ashley and the, the the whole club going to a mess and Rafa Benitez not losing his job. I reckon this whole two week period is just going to be that one time to Benitez is going to sit him down and say, "Right, lads, let's actually focus here. We need to start doing things." He'll have two weeks to drill that into him. And on his and on their day, Newcastle can pull incredible results out of the bag. Um, plus the travelling factor, because I think it's the longest trip in the Premier League, I'm not 100% sure, but the travelling factor, Brian away to Newcastle, I say Newcastle win that comfortably, so my guaranteed loser is Brighton over Albion. A solid shout. And what about yourself, Carl? So for me, I think I'm going to go Watford this week, Then away at Wolves. Interesting. Um, I, I think the start Wolves are bad. They're really, they're really buzzing. Um, they've they've got a great squad there, and the momentum's with them. And I just don't see Watford having enough to go there. 
and get something because I think at Molyneux with that crowd behind them, Wolves are really buzzing. That place will be rocking um, and I just don't see them having enough to stop an informed Wolves at the moment, mate. OK, yeah, I mean, Watford were, I guess, brought back to reality, weren't they, after that heavy defeat at home to Bournemouth? It'll be interesting to see if Javi Grazia sort of rings the changes because he's tried to be as consistent with his team lineups as he has. Um, not quite as much as Wolves, obviously, they haven't made a change at all, but Watford have only made two, and that's due to injuries both at right back. So they've tried to sort of have the same cohesion each week. That will have to change because I know Cabaselli suspended. So it will be interesting, but like I say, Wolves are just purring at the moment. But I mean, we've been waxing lyrical about Wolves almost all season on this podcast. Yeah, we're that's right. Yeah, we're almost sort of secret Wolves fans at this point, but um, <laughs> well, not so secret Wolves fans. Uh, but um, yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a fair shout. I'm going to offer up. Um, I think Crystal Palace will lose away to Everton. I just think we're not really talking about Palace in relegation circles just yet. But you know, they're just not really. They're not clicks this season. I mean, I know they had a nightmare start last season so that's probably why no one's really sort of panicking just at the moment but I think they will need to sort of get better they need to find goals I think they've scored what is it five this season um, already so it's not looking um, too great for them I will um, yeah I'm going to put uh, Palace into the mix so let's uh, recap Uh, Matthew's gone for Brighton away at Newcastle I mean we keep saying that every game's a must win game at the moment for Newcastle but you feel this one is because if Brighton win, that's another team in that sort of bottom bracket which will get further away and that will only add pressure to Rafa Benitez and his men. Carl has gone for Watford to lose at Wolves and I've gone for Palace to lose at Everton. So that is our losable picks of the week. And that just about wraps everything up on our sort of slightly different podcast for this week. A tinkering of the format, but with international break, why not? You know, we've got nothing better to do, have we? So um, I just want to um, extend my thanks to my guests. You've been absolutely brilliant tonight. I've had such a blast. Um, this will definitely be a topic we revisit in the next international break. So, I mean, if any listeners want to chip in with their pet hates or you want to be the next person to offer your pet hates, do get in touch with me on the sort of uh, platforms that I offered up earlier in the show. And, yeah, like I say, uh, just uh, thanks to Carl for being on tonight and welcome back to Proceedings. Cheers, Dan. Great to be back, mate. Not a problem, mate. And also thanks to Matthew. And, of course, Matthew, if you want to be a guest during the season when we sort of talk to the, the real business of all the, the real football, you're more than welcome also. By all means, it's been a pleasure being on and I absolutely, if it's anything like this, I'd absolutely love to come back. Thank you very much, mate. That's very kind of you. So then, it just needs you to say that my name's Dan Tracy. This is the Real Football Cast in association with Loser Paul. And until next week, goodbye. <laughs>